I know John's giving me payback for all the times I've asked him to read before my sermon, so now I get to be up here to read for you. And there's actually two readings, so I'm glad he didn't give me three. He'd be up here a half hour for him. But uh, the first one's out of 1 Timothy. So 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 16. So 1 Timothy chapter 1, 12 through 16. <clears throat> I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. And the second reading is out of Romans, Romans chapter 3, 20 to 24. So Romans 3, 20, 24. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for, who all, for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everybody here today. Let me bring that down just a little bit. Joe, thank you for reading the scriptures. Last Sunday, uh, knowing that I was going to be up here today, I asked Joe if he would read the scripture for me, and he said, sure, no problem. Just let me know what it is. So Monday, I texted him two scriptures to read, and he immediately texted me back two scriptures and so I replied I said yes I felt that if one is good two is better but I really had an ulterior motive I figured the longer he was up here the less I had to be up here and I almost Joe texted you back with six or seven more scriptures to read so you're lucky I'm not <laughs> but thank you if you listen to what Joe said in the scriptures and also in the song that Dale had to sing just before I got up here. I think he's psychic. Amazing Grace. Does anybody want to take a wager, a guess on what I might be talking about today? <laughs> amazing Grace. A, oh, Amazing Grace. Okay, Grace. Okay, sure. Grace is used in the Bible 138 times. Now, Joe, I believe, uh, used the word grace twice in his scriptures. That only leaves me 136 more scriptures that we can read. So have a seat, relax, and uh, if you get bored, there's still food in the back, I think. <laughs> grace is a word that is often hard to define and is sometimes not used correctly by others. But what is grace, and what does it mean? The dictionary defines grace as joy, pleasure, delight, sweetness, charm, loveliness. In the Bible, Ephesians 2:22 through Ephesians 2:2 2, 2 through 10, it says, "But because of His great love for us." God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace impressed in the kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved 
through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's a lot to think about, isn't it? By grace refers to God's favor upon those who have transgressed his law and sinned against him. But grace may also be understood as a power in these verses. God's grace not only offers salvation, but also secures it. Saved refers to deliverance from God's wrath in the final judgment. In Romans 5, 9, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath than through him? By grace you have been saved communicates that the Christian's salvation is fully secured through faith. Faith is a confident trust and reliance upon Christ Jesus and is the only means by which one can obtain salvation. For it's from these passages that we learn that grace is unmerited favor. This is what is so amazing about God's free gift of grace. Even though you and I were hopelessly lost in sin, God loved us enough to give his son as perfect sacrifice so that we could be saved. There's nothing, absolutely nothing, that you or I could ever do to earn merit or God's saving grace. And that's why he had to give it to us. In Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Mankind desperately needs the grace of God in order to be saved because we can't save ourselves. Under the old law, you had to keep it perfect in order to be blameless. In James 2.10, it tells us, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. No human could do this except for one, Jesus Christ. And it is only through him that the grace of God is possible. A lot of people simply just do not understand the grace of God, what it is, and what it involves. Many in the religious world will take sections of the scripture that we looked at in Ephesians 2 and will say that we are saved by grace alone. But this simply is not the case. Though you cannot say that you are saved by faith or grace alone, because the Word of God simply just doesn't teach that. As we just read in Ephesians chapter 2, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, but is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In these verses, we learned two parts of man's salvation. First of all is God's grace, in which he gave his son for the, give, for the forgiveness of sin. Man has his part to do, and that's faith. This is not talking about just believing, but instead is talking about obedient faith. In other words, God has provided the gift, but we humans have to accept that gift by an obedient faith. Notice the verse says that we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. 
Let me provide a basic example. It's an example you've probably heard maybe in a different form. But let's say that I have, and I don't have it with me, if I have this nice new computer that I'm holding here, and I tell you that it is a free gift, but you have to walk up here and you have to get it. Even though the gift is free and you didn't earn it, you didn't even deserve it, you still have to do your part. And what is that? You have to come up here to receive the computer. This is the same principle that God has always had. We have several examples where God offers a free gift, but then he demands obedient faith. Jericho was a free gift to the children of Israel, as we've seen in Joshua 6, 1 through 27. And I'm not going to read all of that. You're probably familiar with it. But in order to receive the gift, they had to obey God's word and walk around those seven days and make the loud noise with the shouting and the trumpets. And it wasn't until they obeyed God's word that they received the free gift. In 2 Kings, starting in verse 5, we learn that Naaman had leprosy, and Elijah sent word to him that he could be healed if he would go dip in the Jordan River seven times. It wasn't until he obeyed that he received the free gift of God. The same thing is true today. We do not receive God's free gift of grace until we obey his commands. The apostles understood this concept very well. In Romans 1.5, through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith, from his namesake. So what does Paul tell us about grace? Well, in Titus 2, 11 through 14, for the grace of God has appeared that offered salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly possessions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that his very own eager to do what is good. If we are saved by grace alone, and since grace has appeared to, to everybody, basically, then that would mean that every single person, no matter what they do, would be saved. But we know that that's not true. In fact, Paul goes on to tell us what grace teaches us. As he notes in verse 12 that I just read, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly possessions and to live self-controlled and upright and godly lives. Paul is clearly teaching us that God's grace and our obedient faith goes hand in hand. Let's be clear that when we obey God's word, and we do things that he asks us today. We are by no means earning or meriting our salvation. We are simply serving God out of love. Jesus explains this best in a story that he tells his disciples in Luke 17, 7 through 10. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down and eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything that you were told to do, would say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Whenever we become Christians, we accept God's grace. 
we become his servants and we are merely to do our duty and when we obey God's word we don't say what are you doing to do for me now no we say that we are unprofitable servants we have done what is our duty to do I have heard people say in the religious world that God's grace cannot be misused but the Bible teaches it differently in Galatians 2.21, it says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. In 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2, as God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. In the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. In Jude 1, 4, for certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago, secretly, you have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immortality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. And in Galatians 5, 4, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ and you have fallen away from grace. As you can see from these passages, we must not take the grace of God for granted. That's why Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3.18 to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As we have grown in God's grace, we learn that we can stand and be strong in God's grace. And in Romans 5, 1 and 2, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And in 2 Timothy 2, 1, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ. I'm still not going to use all 36 of them, but I have a few more. Paul also teaches that grace is not a license to sin. In Romans 6, 1, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Well, some people may think that, but I don't really think that's the way it works. One of the great things about God's amazing grace is that when we do sin, his grace covers us over and over and over again. 1 John 1, 7 tells us how. It says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Paul gives us an answer as we continue in Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ has risen from the dead through the glory of our Father, we too may live a new life. There's nothing confusing about what Paul is trying to teach us here. It's very easy to see that when a person is baptized into Christ, they are baptized into his death. And just as Christ was baptized, was raised from the dead, when we are raised from the watery grave of baptism, we begin our walk in the newness of life. This is when we accept God's saving grace through our obedient faith in the working of God. Now that we've learned a little bit when a person begins their walk, 
Let's take a look at some of the scriptures that tell us how we are to walk. In 1 John 2.6, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9, although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. In 2 John 1, 6, and this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. And in Ephesians 5, 15, 16. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Another important part of God's amazing grace is that we know when we are saved. Sometimes we as Christians simply lose sight of God's grace. And we go along in life saying, gosh, I hope I've been saved. Have any of you ever asked that question of yourselves? We know that we are saved by the grace of God. Amen. In 1 John 5.13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. 1 John 2, 5. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. In Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In 2 Timothy 4, 6 and 8. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. I want to ask all of you a question. What do I do and what am I doing with God's grace? As we discussed throughout this lesson, God's grace is a wonderful gift available to everyone here. If you are not a Christian yet, the first thing that you need to do is to accept and respond to God's grace by following the direction of his word and being baptized into his son for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are a Christian, and I assume most everybody here is, you have already taken the first step in accepting God's grace. But what are you doing with that grace each day? Think about these questions as you consider God's grace. Am I walking in the light and being faithful to God? If not, what's hindering me? Do I put all my trust in God each day? Do I study his word to understand his will for my life? Do I constantly demonstrate God's love to others in my actions? Do I regularly gather with other believers to worship and praise God? And if I do, is my heart and mind focused on the worship services each and every time? Do I give of my time and resources to support God's church? And one final question. What else can I do each day to better serve God and thank him for his amazing grace? If any of you still have not found God in your life and wish to feel his presence and his grace, I invite you to come up, come forward, as we sing this song of invitation so that we can pray for and with you.